Good afternoon, and welcome to the latest edition of the National Security Space Association's Space Time Interview Series. My name is Chris Williams, and I have the honor and privilege of serving as the chair of the Mormon Center for Space Studies, the association's independent think tank. I will moderate today's interview. The association is devoted to enhancing collaboration and partnership between industry and government to strengthen the U.S. national security space enterprise. With nearly 100 member companies, NSSA conducts a wide variety of programming and activities, ranging from large conferences as well as smaller classified and unclassified events to promote dialogue on key topics of interest to the national security space community. We also conduct these space-time interviews with leading U.S. national security uh, officials. And we publish scholarly papers on a broad range of topics. Indeed, we'll release a major paper on dynamic space operations next week. So be on the lookout for that. You can find out more by visiting the association's website at www.nssaspace.org. Today, we are honored to have with us Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, the former director of the Department of Defense's All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, or ARO. Dr. Kirkpatrick directed the stand-up of that office and led its growth and maturation. Prior to Arrow, Dr. Kirkpatrick served in key positions at the Naval Research Lab, the Air Force Research Lab, the National Reconnaissance Office, the Central Intelligence Agency, the Defense Intelligence Agency, and the Office of the Secretary of Defense. He served as the Defense Intelligence Officer for Scientific and Technical Intelligence, the Deputy Director of Intelligence at U.S. Strategic Command, and the De Deputy Director of Intelligence and DNI representative at U.S. Space Command. He also served on the National Security Council staff. Dr. Kirkpatrick is the recipient of several scientific, military, and intelligence awards. Sean, thanks for your service and thanks for being with us today. A quick word about our format. Dr. Kirkpatrick will provide some brief op opening remarks about the recently released ARO report on the historical record of U.S. government involvement with unidentified anomalous phenomena or UAP, Volume 1. Following his remarks, I will ask questions about that report. Members of our audience are encouraged to submit questions by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. I can't promise I'll get through all of your questions, but we'll, uh, we'll at least get through some of them. We've allotted a total of one hour for today's interview, so let's get to it. Without further ado, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here with my uh, national security space colleagues, especially as I bring closure to one of the last deliverables of my final government assignment. Uh, as you know, ARA was given two missions, operational and historical. Uh, the operational mission is the most important as it deals with the safety and security of our operators, our national security spaces, and our nation. The operational mission aims to minimize the risk of intelligence and technical surprise. The historical mission and the topic of the recent report is focused on investigating allegations of a government conspiracy to hide reverse engineering programs of extraterrestrial technology. That mission was also to review all previous investigations, activities, and studies that the U.S. government has conducted on this topic going back to 1945. While the final report is not due until to Congress until June of this year, uh, we had decided to break up the report into two volumes in order to get the bulk of the information uh, out to Congress in volume one and to accelerate transparency and data sharing to the appropriate members. This report has both a classified and an unclassified version. The classified version, along with evidence at the highest classification levels, has been provided to the appropriately cleared congressional oversight committees and leadership. This includes the House and Senate Armed Services Committees, the House and Senate Intelligence Committees, the House and Senate Appropriations Committees, and House and Senate Leadership. Note that it does not include any other House or Senate committees or members not in that group. As I've said since day one, my team and I would follow that evidence where it leads, wherever it leads, and that I would be open and objective to any hypothesis as long as the data supports it. Unfortunately, we live in a world of double standards where the reverse is not necessarily true and people don't want to accept what evidence suggests when it is counter to belief. This report's not gonna change any of those people's minds. 
And you can tell them apart by how loudly they cry out and how personal the attacks become because that's usually the fallback position when there's no evidence to the contrary. I'd like to point out that there are many people who came forward privately to discuss their observations and concerns, who provided invaluable testimony, and who provided valuable historical information at the risk of personal condemnation and continue to remain anonymous. Those people have our thanks and gratitude. As a reminder, I can only talk to what I did up to retiring. We're not gonna speak about the operational mission today, so we'll focus on really this historical report. And so with that, let's dig into your questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Sean. Um, we'll now turn to Q&A. And again, for our audience, please feel free to submit questions uh, using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. I see a handful have come in already. Um, let me start with uh, a fundamental uh, question. Dr. Kirkpatrick, to the best of your knowledge, has the U.S. government ever been in possession of extraterrestrial technology or non-human beings? No, and we have found no evidence to support those allegations. And let's let's dive into some of the, the key points of the, uh, the Aero Historical Report that was recently delivered to Congress, as you mentioned, and published on the Department of Defense website. The report states, and I quote, Aero found no evidence that any USG investigation, academic sponsored research, or official review panel has confirmed that any sighting of a UAP represented extraterrestrial technology. All investigative efforts at all levels of classification concluded that most sightings were ordinary objects and phenomena and the results of misidentification. Can you elaborate on that, uh, that key finding? Sure. So this, this really points to all of the studies that were done going back uh, to, to the earliest, earliest days in, in the 40s. Um, there were uh, dozens of these kinds of studies and reports on uh, single events or entire series of events such as Blue Book. Um, most all of those turned out to be exactly what is stated there. They're all um, ordinary objects or phenomena or the result of misidentification, but none of them turned up any evidence at any classification level uh, that anything to support uh, that any UAP represented extraterrestrial technology. The, re the historical report also states, and I quote, Arrow found no empirical evidence for claims that the USG and private companies have been reverse engineering extraterrestrial technology. Uh, Arrow determined, based on all information provided to date, that claims involving specific people, known locations, technological tests, and documents allegedly involved in or related to the reverse engineering of extraterrestrial technology are inaccurate. How did Arrow reach that conclusion? And in that regard, can you discuss relevant issues associated uh, with that finding, such as UAP non-disclosure agreements, uh, the involvement of a particular CIA official, an alleged uh, intelligence community document, claims that a military officer touched an off-world craft, an extraterrestrial spacecraft sample, and other relevant matters that were laid out in the uh, unclassified report? Sure, that's, that's quite a lot, but yes, we can. Uh, let me try to elaborate on some of that. So um, the, the, the finding is as the finding states, right? There was no evidence to support that story. So the storyline, uh, which I think I highlighted a bit in my uh, uh, Scientific American uh, article, but is also laid out in the uh, report itself, speaks to a number of activities where um, there was alleged reverse engineering by the government. The government was unable to make progress, abandoned the program to industry. Industry kept on it and their own internal investment and uh, trying to figure out how to make it work. And then there was some um, um, effort to made to bring that material back into government oversight. And the allegation is that CIA stood in, stood in and said no, uh, pointing to actually very specific individuals. Um, 
and that associated with all of this, you know, there was claims of a very high ranking military officer who actually touched one of these and that there was an extraterrestrial sample of material that was provided back to um, the, one of these companies to see if they could reverse engineer or fabricate. Um, what is fascinating about all of that is uh, when you actually peel that back and you go talk to those people, um, and, like the CIA officials, um, the military intelligence, uh, sorry, the military officers, um, all of them put on the record and, and signed their name to it that none of that was true. It was all either fabricated or misunderstood, like the, the allegation that this particular military officer may have touched an off-world uh, craft. He was actually working on the F-117 and it was in transit and it was a piece of that that he was uh, speaking to at the time. Um, the extraterrestrial spacecraft sample uh, actually has no chain of custody. Uh, it was alleged to have come from a crash in the, I think it was the 60s, uh, maybe, maybe 50s, and was passed down, was bought, was then um, handed back over to a company to see if they could uh, reverse engineer that. That, that piece of material uh, had turned out to be uh, likely a piece of aircraft uh, material or missile casing from the Air Force. Um, it had nothing to do with extraterrestrial. In fact, didn't match anything from extraterrestrial. Uh, UAP non-disclosure agreements are alleged to have been uh, conducted either separately or under the Atomic Energy Act or under the Air Force. Um, and then really surrounding the NDAs are a lot of allegations about you know, threats of um, uh, retaliation uh, by death if they uh, gave away this information. What's interesting about the NDA um, discussion. First, there are no UAP specific NDAs. With the exception of there was a there was a fake uh, UAP program that we called out in the report uh, that was used as training uh, and a hoax. And so by the letter of the definition, that was a UAP NDA, but it wasn't a real UAP NDA. Uh, and the NDAs writ large, what a lot of people fail to uh, account for is prior to about 2000, I believe 13, uh, NDAs were not standard. Uh, they were all uh, done per organization, per service, but they all had Title 18 language in them. Title 18 is the language that is uh, called out for um, consequences of disclosing classified information to anybody, but especially to foreign governments. And in Title 18, uh, it does actually say, if you give away um, classified information to a foreign government, uh, you, know, you can be punished with a range of punishments up to and including death. Um, that language got, uh, sometimes pulled out and put into an NDA up front, and sometimes it's just called out as Title 18 language. After 2017, all NDAs became standardized into two forms, um, and that, that specific language is no longer visible when you look at it, but if you dig into the title, uh, that's, a, that's an implied uh, consequence. The point of that is, Contextually, if you're a young officer and this is your first exposure to a lot of things in the classified world and somebody puts one of these NDAs in front of you and it calls out punishment by death, that's going to stick with you. And if you're on one of these unfortunate people that may have um, victim to a, one of the fake uh, UAP NDAs, that's going to stick with you. 
so th these are all pieces of a story that contribute to the larger narrative, um, none of which is, is true when you dig into it. it. It has different aspects that are colored by different people's perceptions and interpretations of uh, a number of events. The historical report also states, and I quote, Arrow assesses that all of the named and described alleged hidden UAP reverse engineering programs provided by interviewees either do not exist, are misidentified as authentic, highly sensitive national security programs that are not related to extraterrestrial technology exploitation, or resolve to an unwarranted and disestablished program. Uh, can you can you elaborate on that? And I, I've got a couple of follow on questions with respect to that particular quote from the report. Yeah, to to some extent. So this is, you know, there are um, there were a large number of programs that people named, right? So they would come in um, in a protected environment. Uh, as the authorized disclosure authority, Arrow could receive all of this information. They would tell us what they thought they knew. They would name a program. Um, at that point, after they finished their interview, right, that information that we hold, we have to, one, we have to protect it as if it is real until we can find it in, you know, the DOD, IC, DOE, NASA universe of special access programs. So we have to protect it as if it is a special access program. When you go and do the research on a number of these named programs, uh, many of them turn out to be, uh, don't exist at all. Uh, and when we say don't exist, we mean not across DOD, IC, DOE, the National Archives, the Service Archives, the Combatant Command Archives, the Intelligence Community Archives. It, they, they just, there's nothing there for, uh, for anybody out of any records. Um, some of them are real programs, but they're real, highly sensitive national security programs, not related to extraterrestrials, um, that we then have to protect and report. And that's what we've reported up to Congress, uh, congressional leadership, right? Here's the list of programs that are being talked about that are not extraterrestrial uh, that you need to be concerned about because that is a risk to programs, right? These and are real. real thank risks. you. And um, as part of the discussion in the, in the historical report, there's reference to a prospective special access program or PSAP uh, called Kona Blue. Can you talk about how that figures in the historical assessment and, yes. and the broader set of, of issues uh, in this case? So it's well known uh, and well documented uh, out in the world uh, of the story of how you know Senator Reed, Harry Reed, wanted to uh, set up a special access program with the Department of Defense to protect uh, alleged uh, information that the then uh, ATIP OSAP program uh, was um, supposedly uncovering and to provide a compartment under which uh, the alleged spacecraft could be returned to uh, government oversight. So the big, the big concern here from, from Reed and from Congress was if this program existed, it, it was no congressional oversight. So he sent a letter uh, to the Secretary of Defense and said, hey, we want to set up this uh, special access program. Secretary of Defense said no, uh, and then had a review of the program with DIA and under Secretary of uh, Defense for Intelligence and said, yeah, not only are we not going to do that, uh, but we're, we're gonna stand this program down because this has nothing to do with, you know, aliens and extraterrestrials. This was supposed to be something else. Senator Reid um, did not necessarily uh, stop at that point. In fact, did not like that answer. And so um, 
reached out to his colleague, uh, Senator Lieberman, who had a uh, connection in the Department of Homeland Security to try to get the Department of Homeland Security to stand up this, this program. And a prospective special access program is a proposal. It's a proposal package that is put together by a group of people uh, to stand up a special access program. That package then has to go through coordination and it goes through general counsel and it goes up through the, the, special, the SAPCO director, the special access program office director and to get approval. And Kona Blue was that program. Uh, they had convinced, uh, Reed and Lieberman had convinced the DHS um, uh, to, to put together that program that, or that proposal. That proposal was written by the, some of the same group of people that came out of the previous program after it was shut down. And so that entire package we found in the DHS archives, um, researched it uh, a year ago, uh, and then uh, worked over the last year prior to my retirement to get it declassified and to get it um, out. I actually sent a um, uh, congressional notification to the Hill last summer when we found it, um, and then had briefed it to them, uh, to the Hill several times since then. It is now out in the report and that package is in its final review for public release. It is, has been declassified and is almost ready to go. Uh, so that is where that program came from. And it, it contributes to this story. Why? Because we had several interviewees come in who named Kona Blue as the program that is housing the uh, you know, reverse engineering and the um, non-human intelligence bodies uh, of these craft. And that is absolutely not the case. In fact, the, the program that was proposed was proposed to set up six centers, uh, research centers. Uh, one was consciousness, one was technology, one was propulsion, and I don't remember what the other two, two or three were. Um, and they were all going to be run by the existing contractor. So I think that will be in the program uh, plan when that comes out and, and everybody will have that. But that, that's where that came from and why it contributes to this story because then you know, come, come forward in time to now and interviewees are naming Kona Blue as one of those programs and, and it's not. The historical report states, quote, Arrow assesses that some portion of sightings since the 1940s have represented misidentification of never before seen experimental and operational space, rocket and air systems, including stealth technologies and the proliferation of drone platforms, end quote. Can you talk a, lot, uh, a little further about this, including the historical context um, in, in essence, it, it, the, this particular finding suggests that that what many people may have seen is is uh, certain U.S. programs um, uh, that that either they they confused with an extraterrestrial or some other uh, activity. Is that what was intended uh, by this finding, or how would you characterize that? Yes, and there's more to it than, than it's just the things that people saw. You have to take into account, and, and here I have to really tip my hat to some of my researchers who did a really excellent job on kind of pulling the context together here. Keep in mind in the 40s, you, you know, the United States was just coming out of uh, World War II, right? It's, you know, it's, everybody's raw. There's still um, um, sensitive feelings about uh, being caught by surprise, uh, you know, Pearl Harbor, what, all the things that had gone into uh, that era. The other thing that happened was there were some new technologies that were used uh, in, during that time that, that hadn't been used in that way in a serious, significant fashion sense. And you know, rockets, 
uh, aircraft, other, other aerospace types of, of activities, balloons even. Uh, so people are, are sensitive to contextually uh, being caught by surprise. There's really new technologies that are breaking into everyday life that they're just starting to wrap their heads around. And as you start to see these things pop up everywhere, people get nervous, they start reporting them, they start trying to figure out what they are, they don't know it. Now, there is, there is a human condition that I don't, um, uh, you know, I'm not a, a psychologist, so I would have to defer to somebody who's better versed than I am, but there is a human condition of, you know, if you, you see something you don't understand and in the lack of, of, of an explanation, right, you are going to fill that void with a belief. What is that belief and where does it come from? And this is, this has been true, you know, and it's based off of, you know, everybody's personal experiences, but they want to, they want to have an explanation to address the, the fear of, under, of not understanding what that thing is. And I think you're seeing a lot of that as well. Uh, and, and so what we're seeing from a, out of that finding is the response to new technologies. And now here we are fast forward today and we have a whole bunch of new technologies that people are trying to wrap their heads around. Um, you know, long distance drones, drones that are starting to use new aerospace principles, uh, AI, right? All the things that are starting to, to you know, space travel, we're seeing more space launches and, and, and more types of space launches that people don't necessarily understand. Do you know how many Starlink uh, satellites and deployments got reported as UAP? I mean, dozens of them. Uh, because people don't, they, they see a string of lights in the sky and they don't know what that is. And you correlate that back to a Starlink deployment. Uh, and so we're seeing, I think, the same phenomena. I think we're seeing a, a, to, as a contributing factor, not the sole factor, but a contributing factor. Thank you. And uh, Sean, you wrote in Scientific American that, quote, Arrow's interest that is all domain phenomena, sea, air, and space, remains an ongoing concern to our national security enterprise, particularly when the phenomena are observed near our nation's sensitive military and critical infrastructure facilities. Observations by experienced military personnel, as well as data from highly capable sensors are being reviewed by Aero accordingly to weed out explainable observations and expose truly difficult to explain phenomenology using the most rigorous scientific analysis available. This is the real job, you said, to minimize the risk of intelligence and technical surprise, as you mentioned before. Can you talk a little bit about, um, uh, based on your professional experience, to what extent are America's adversaries involved in UAP-related activities? And is our lack of knowledge on this topic a result of adversary uh, denial and deception? Um, or uh, is it limited and effective sensors that we don't have enough sensors in the right place at the right time with the right collecting the right phenomenologies combination thereof what what do you think about that i mean on the one hand the report categorically says and you have said that there's no evidence of of off-world technology or off-world beings at the same time there are plenty of unexplained activities so how, how do you how do you think about that problem and what has arrow done in this particular area So that, that, yeah, that's a that's a good question, and this is this is where kind of the sweet spot of why Arrow is important, right? Unknown means initially, when observed, people or sensors can't make sense of what is being observed. That doesn't mean it's unknowable. It means it's unknown at that time. And with sufficient data, even the most difficult of the unknown cases uh, can be pulled apart and analyzed and understood. Mm -hmm. It is the hunt for the things that may represent a technological leap 
or it may be not a technological leap, but something that somebody is doing to the United States that we weren't tracking before, like, oh, I don't know, Chinese high altitude balloon, right? You have to uh, analyze and investigate and pull that data apart. It's not, a fa it's not a question of, do we not have enough sensors or ineffective sensors? Absolutely not. We have, we have more sensor coverage than, than you can possibly imagine. Um, is it a factor of adversary denial and deception? Well, they, they try uh, and you know, they're good at some of the things that they try and they're not so good at other things that they try. And we, we, it's a spy versus spy world and game and we, we get on with that. This is a domain awareness problem, plain and simple. It doesn't matter if you're talking about UAP or you're talking about a stealth aircraft. This is a domain awareness problem. And what that means is we have a lot of data from a lot of different sensors. Whether or not we have data for a particular event is a, is a different question. But in general, we have lots of data uh, across lots of sensors. And we need to train the sensors and the data exploitation tools to look for some of the signatures that they aren't currently looking for. And what do I mean by that? Our, our air domain awareness sensors are trained and operators are trained to look for missiles, aircraft, fast moving, you know, uh, big drone, you know, even large drones, not small drones. Um, they're meant to look for those things to prevent uh, somebody from launching missiles into the United States. They are not trained. Uh, to exploit the data to look for a quadcopter. And so understanding what does a quadcopter look like in those kinds of uh, sensor systems is part of the design space that we laid out starting um, when we stood up era, right? Because you got to go calibrate all of that stuff and then you've got to go figure out what tools you need to exploit it. So, um, to, it's a long way of answering your question of my, my experience is there is a number of factors that go into this. Um, adversaries are trying to spy on us just as we're trying to spy on them. Does that mean that UAP, any given UAP could be an adversary? It could be. It's a question of, is it? And then you have, you have the burden of proof. You have to, you have to, identify what it is you're looking at and you have to identify uh, signatures that relate to a particular country. So you have attribution and then you have intent. And, and those are the things that you have to go investigate if you're gonna make that case. Uh, should Arrow, DOD and the IC focus their limited collection and analytic resources primarily on UAP phenomena above or near sensitive U.S. military bases and training ranges? And why or why not? I mean, one of the questions is, uh, is there a correlation of sightings that, that tend to be around certain locations? And are those locations where there are concentrations, you know, military test ranges, for example, where, where high-tech new capabilities are being tested or or fielded uh, and the like. So what, what's your general sense of how we should allocate and apportion what are admittedly limited uh, collection capabilities? So there's, there's actually three pieces to that, that question, right? So I, never one, answer, I never ask a single question. It's always... Yeah. Yeah, there, there, there's, you, you, your, your question leaves a lot uh, of, of things we have to discuss, right? One, if you look at the heat map that's on the uh, Arrow website, you'll see that, and I've said this in testimony and I've said this in the public, right? You'll see that those are collection biased uh, spots. That means, right, for those of you not tracking what that is, that we have, that is where we have all of our sensors. That is where we have all of our pilots. They are the ones and the sensors are the ones that are that are alerting us of, of thing activity. Um, we don't have a whole lot of collection outside of that. 
So to, to, you can't draw the conclusion that there are um, higher probabilities of UAP around those institution or those installations and, and training ranges because you don't know what normal looks like. You don't have a pattern of life. You don't have a baseline across areas outside of those, air, of those installations and ranges. And so again, Arrow laid that out to go do. That was one of the things that, that we were working on before I retired. Um, because once you have that map, then you can tell, is there a spike in activity when there's a sensitive test going on? If there is, then you can draw the conclusion that there's a correlation. If there's not, then you can draw the conclusion that you have a safety and a hazard problem because you have a bunch of stuff in your space uh, that's just floating through all the time. And you'd be surprised what's in your, in your air. Um, so then you get to the apportionment of collection. Um, the first and foremost thing you should probably all recognize as national security professionals is turning the intelligence community's collection apparatus onto the backyard of the United States is generally frowned upon. Um, there is a lot of uh, oversight that has to be uh, put in place. Um, there is a lot of protections that have to be put in place to um, protect American citizens and institutions against inadvertent um, collection. Uh, you know, for somebody to say, hey, I keep seeing, you know, something out in our backyard in the middle of Kansas, let's put all the collection onto the middle of Kansas, um, that is generally not going to be received well. So we have to, you have to plan carefully. Now, even training ranges, uh, I think a lot of people probably don't recognize that training ranges are also uh, a large extent of them are over uh, private properties. So, you know, flying, flying uh, training exercises for, you know, F-22s, F-35s, a lot of that occurs over other people's properties. Uh, so while it is controlled airspace, the ground is, is somebody else's or, you know, um, ownership. So I, I, you can't just collect on that at, you know, uh, ad hoc. That being said, um, we did prioritize, again, prior to my retirement, I prioritized um, a set of ranges that had high reporting. Now that high reporting is because those groups are um, sensitive to the reporting requirements. We're already doing their reporting properly. And, and so we prioritized, hey, can we get some additional collection in those areas and do a baseline pattern of life so that we can figure out what's, what's going on there? So it's not a simple question, Chris. I don't think you can just say, should we focus on those? You have to start somewhere. So let's start with where we know we are getting reporting, which is right now national security areas, whether it's uh, nuclear critical infrastructure or military bases, both of which have, sen have uh, sensors out there to find out if you know, people are flying drones in the area or there's <coughs> aircraft in the area, right? So bootstrap your way up and then lay out a, a larger plan. Can you talk about some of the historical cases involving on orbit anomalous uh, phenomena? To what extent has Arrow focused on space related UAP and what actions can or should be taken to improve collection and analysis in, in those areas? Is there, in your experience, is there, are there, uh, is there a significant collection of uh, of, of sightings or, or, you know, radar collections or, or other sensor collections uh, in space that are, are of concern or should be of concern? And, and are those getting attention that they need uh, to understand what happened and why and all that? So I can, I can speak to the plan that I had laid out, um, the framework I had laid out before. Um, 
how they're going forward, you'd have to go back and talk to Arrow about. But, but the way we laid it out before was again, uh, let's start with the air domain because that is where the bulk of the reporting is coming from. So we focused on getting those requirements in place, the reporting requirements in place, the data uh, storage and data retention policies in place. Um, how do you get all that information saved and transitioned over to Arrow and lay all that out? The next domain to integrate was the space domain. And we had started working that with uh, you know, the space community uh, last summer uh, or a little bit before last spring. Uh, and again, that is a domain awareness problem. There's a lot of data associated with uh, everything from on, you know, debris to satellite tracking on orbit. The question is the same to the space community as it is to the air community of, okay, well, how much of that data are we training our algorithms to look for you know, anomalous behavior? And the answer is actually on the space domain a lot more than in the air domain, because it's easier to define what is anomalous in the space domain, uh, because you have Kepler's laws that you have to baseline against, right? So a piece of debris that suddenly starts maneuvering is an anomalous thing and should be investigated, but that's what US Space Command does, right? So it's a question of, is there anything that falls outside of that uh, purview that we need to then look at. And, and the answer is largely no. Um, there's been, there were one or two um, things that somebody sent me on um, pictures that were taken from the space station of um, objects that were, you know, going around the earth and they looked odd. But when you correlate it, it's just debris. And so people are taking pictures of debris from the space station because they take pictures of everything from the space station. And somebody got a hold of it and, and tried to make the claim that it was a, um, you know, a UAP that was coming down from orbit. Well, there was no radar data to support that. The piece of the object, you know, tracked back to a piece of debris. Those are the kinds of things that, um, you know, we didn't even bother to go much further than that with. Um, there were, however, some historical cases, going back to the historical report of, um, you know, there, was, there were the allegations of, of um, uh, pictures from one of the early astronaut missions, I think it was Apollo 13, um, that, uh, you know, was allegedly supposed to have um, evidence of, of a, a tic-tac thing in its, in its field of view. Well, we pulled those original images and looked at them and it's actually a film defect. It's not anything that has anything to do with a UAP. And then there was another allegation of uh, Mars, there was a Mars story, I love that one, um, where there was an oblong thing that was imaged um, and it oriented differently. And when you pull that imagery, NASA pulled that one and it's, it is another uh, image artifact because the image actually goes outside of the field of, uh, outside of the frame and it's on the actual outer edge, outer margins of the, of the image outside of the image. So that was a, that was a different camera issue. Um, but those are the kinds of things that get, you know, spun up as space things. And, and we've, we've had no evidence of any space UAP that substantiates into an actual UAP. And the, the U S government, uh, you and, in, in uh, Congressional testimony have highlighted certain videos and and other activities that that uh, some of which are explained and some of which are not. Can you tell us more about what the government knows about the so-called Tic Tac gimbal and go fast cases, um, wherein U.S. military pilots saw what appeared to them 
uh, as unusual aircraft that had were demonstrating highly unusual behaviors. Are, are those cases still open? Have they been resolved? Can you tell us the status of the investigations into those particular cases? Well, I, can't, I can't tell you what the status is today. I can tell you where, where I left it when I, when I left. Um, I, I testified uh, multiple times on the fact that Tic Tac, there's some, you know, there's some great eyewitness accounts of what was what is described as the Tic Tac. What was lacking is data, right? So I worked with one of the pilots to try to get to tease out a little bit more of the what exactly was it that we were potentially witnessing, and and by the descriptions of everything from water to water disturbance to motion, relative motion, and how you can maybe you know, see what you're seeing. Unfortunately, what's gonna happen is, I think that one, my, my opinion is that one is going to remain unresolved because there is no data. There is no radar data. Uh, allegations of you know the the secret black helicopter that came and picked up the ch tapes. None of that happened. There's no there's no evidence that somebody pulled the tapes off. What does happen, and and this is why we had to change the data retention policy was all of these platforms have fixed storage or a fixed amount of storage, and they only retain the data for any given mission you know, maybe a day, uh, and unless there is a, um, a, a uh, uh, problem with the platform that they use the data for diagnostics for. And then the next time that that platform goes out, the data is overwritten. So there's no, there's no conspiracy in that. That's just how the military operates with these, these data tapes and, and whatnot. So we did write new policy that said, hey, look, if you're, if you're reporting a UAP, you have to save all of that data and transmit it to ERA um, within some period of time. Uh, so I think the Tic Tac is so far back in time, there's no, there's no data. We went and looked for all the data. But the other thing that we, you know, I asked around a bit, which, um, I don't know, uh, it certainly hadn't been answered by the time I, I left was, you know, there wasn't a lot of uh, asking or questioning of other activities that might've been going on at the time, um, either naval activities or adversary activities. And both of those needed to be explored at that time because records of when tests, for example, were, were done, um, that far back in time may not may not be accurate or exist, and and records of any adversary activity, you know, will be hard to to track down for exact date and time stamps, right? And that's those are the kinds of things that you want to get. So we'd have to look at that. All right. So uh, Go Fast actually was explained at the NASA panel. Uh, they did a really nice job of pulling that apart and demonstrating that that was parallax. Um, I think uh, where I left that with Arrow was to take the analysis from uh, NASA, uh, double check everybody, double checks everybody, and then put that out as, as closure. I don't know where the status of that is. That's where I left it. And Gimbal, uh, we had hypothesized, uh, was likely an artifact of uh, how the um, sensor operates as well as looking at a, uh, a you know, a, a, a known object, uh, probably a jet, uh, and then seeing how that, you know, a FLIR, uh, you know, blurs all of that kind of information. And so the only way you're going to prove that is you actually have to recreate it in the lab. And so one of the things that, again, that I had tried to get started before I uh, retired was to do that, get the, get the actual sensor platform or it, you know, one of the laboratory surrogates 
and go recreate the entire scene in the lab and make sure that it does what we think it does so that you could close that out as well. I don't know where that stands today, but that's that's what I had intended then. We have a, a number of questions from the audience. Let me pose a couple of them to you here in the remaining time. One question is, have any UAPs demonstrated capabilities that are beyond our technical understanding? No. And let's see. So let me, let me comment a little bit more on that. So yeah. all the ones that people think we're doing things, like uh, one of my favorites is the Puerto Rico one where everybody claims it goes into the water and out of the water and then disappears. Mm -hmm. um, that is actually uh, not what happens. The, the, uh, the FLIR, the way a FLIR operates is when the object is at the range, you know, at, at a, at a at, it, it is measuring relative differences to the background. So it's contrast. So when an object is IR reflecting or cool to the same ambient temperature as the background or irradiance as the background, it will look like it disappears. And in this case, this particular object um, was both a factor of, of uh, parallax, which has been recreated, and I believe the um, status of that is still being uh, declassified or, or re reviewed for public release. I don't think it's classified. And then the um, temperature irradiance, um, you know, I had actually gotten the, the uh, models for that uh, system and had it recreate that whole thing. And it does exactly that. It makes an object disappear. And I think um, that is something that we're going to, um, uh, I think NASA is, is looking at uh, recreating or NOVA. I, actually, it's NOVA. NOVA is going to recreate that as part of their analysis for their series. Let's see, a couple of other questions. Um, there are allegations in the media that you were forced to resign. Are those accurate? No, that's, that's, that's ludicrous. Um, both the Deputy Secretary of Defense uh, put a statement out, Pentagon put a statement out. I actually told uh, Deputy Secretary last July uh, that I would likely retire by the end of the year once I met all of my goals and, and objectives for uh, Arrow, um, which I kept on our scorecard, which I briefed to Congress and to her on a regular basis. So that was not a surprise to anyone and it was, it was known since July. And we have another question from the audience. Does Arrow possess the legal access required, legal authorities, required to retrieve information from government agencies or private companies about UAPs? And, um, or, and or is there additional, are additional authorities needed <clears throat> to strengthen the ability to collect information? Now, I get asked that question almost every time and the answer is always the same. Arrow has all the legal authorities it needs. It is written into law in NDAA 23. We've had general counsel review it and put a statement out to that effect. We've had DOD and, and, and IC and other partners write letters that say, we're all agreed, this is how we're gonna do this. And, and they're authorized to receive everything. And we've not had anything denied to us at least at that time as i left that was that was all done um, i had stood up with the sapco and capco um, you know a security construct uh, to handle all that information and i think the evidence of it working is the dhs uh, psap right that was a psap in somebody else's authorities that we discovered and were able to work with them to get declassified and released Let's see, uh, there are several questions from the audience concerning 
a 2004 Nimitz UAP incident that it, uh, one uh, writer here says was widely covered in CBS 60 Minutes and other media. Um, can you comment on, on that particular incident and the specific question that a number of folks have asked is that that particular incident was not included in the historical report? Is That's the tic -tac. That? That, that was the tic-tac, right? Uh, and so remember, there's there's a volume two that will include anything that we didn't put in volume one, um, which is not going to be a whole lot more, I don't think. But you know, that's up to them to see what else it goes. But uh, Nimitz is is the Tic Tac incident, um, and again, there's not a lot that you can put in there that's not already out in the public domain. Um, so I wouldn't I wouldn't expect you're going to get a lot of resolution on that, but we'll wait and see what comes out. We have just a couple of minutes left. Um, let me ask you to uh, to give you a chance to kind of summarize uh, with this question. What does the history report tell you about U.S. government interest in and action on UAP sightings over the years? What, what lessons did, did you draw from the, the historical look? Uh, that dated back many, you know, many decades and the reaction to events and how they responded to a previous government's uh, uh, administrations, responded to different events, et cetera. What are, what are the right lessons to be learned from the history report? Um, you know, that's, that's, a, that's, a good, that's a good question. There's, there are a number of things to take away from this, not the least of which is that the complexity of the different contributing factors that go into the general belief and, and conclusion and continued persistent um, you know, conspiracy theory is, it comes up periodically. So if you look back in time, the contemporary uh, allegations that we're dealing with today um, had their roots 60, 70 years ago. And it, it, it waxes and wanes with some variation on that story over time. Um, and every time, you know, the, 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 the little variations that go into that um, tend to not, you know, bear fruit. They, they end up being not true. Uh, but the fact that no one will will recognize that means that there's some other fundamental uh, factor at play here uh, because the truth is contrary to the belief and so i think the thing to take away from this is um, there is a belief um, without evidence that is never going to go away I think the thing that is most um, troublesome to me is the number of people that uh, are in government uh, that I may have worked with for decades uh, that I did not know had that belief until they sat down in my office and told me, you know, I'm not going to help you because you're part of the government cover up of all the alien technology. And for somebody who I've you know, known for a while and worked on highly sensitive national security problems on, to say that without evidence as a belief is disturbing and should be a flag for the national security community. Because how can you then trust those people? If they are not objective enough to understand evidentiary-based assertions like that uh, or lack of evidence in those assertions, how can you trust them with nation, our national secrets? Um, I think that's a, that is a, a point of research by somebody else at another time, but I think that is certainly a concern. Well, thank you very much. We are unfortunately out of time. Uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick, we appreciate your service. 
And uh, the fact that you were willing to spend some of your day with us today, I appreciate you answering the questions in a straightforward manner. And um, we look forward to uh, having our viewers back for the next iteration of our space time interview series. So uh, Sean, thank you again. And uh, for all of our viewers, uh, look, be on the lookout for additional notifications of upcoming space time events and reports from the National Security Space Association. Thank you very much. And uh, everyone have a great day out here. Chris, bye.